Uh, good morning everyone and welcome to another service here on the St Thomas Baptist Church YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for joining us wherever you are, if you're in Exeter um, or further afield you're very welcome uh, and we're glad that you're here watching the service this morning with us. Uh, if this is your first time here on the channel I would recommend going and looking at all the other resources that we have here available to you. Um, services from weeks past both morning and evening uh, as well as Sunday schools um, and thoughts for the day on that we put on a Thursday evening as well. Uh, uh, they're all there available for you to have a look at. Um, if you would like to subscribe, that'd be really good as well. Um, you can be notified of all the resources that we're pushing on uh, as time carries on. Uh, otherwise, please feel free to uh, have a look at everything that we've put on there so far uh, and use them at your leisure. We're really glad that you're with us this morning uh, for another service here. Um, we may be f further afield, um, i.e. not together, um, but we're really encouraged that we can uh, meet in another sense through technology um, and use the talents and gifts uh, of all the people in our congregation, um, although separated, we can collate and, and put them together. So we've got another collection of people um, as part of the St Thomas Baptist Church who will be uh, sharing today, uh, either through reading, uh, praying, um, a bit of music as well, also on offer, uh, and ultimately uh, opening God's Word to us this morning as well. Uh, so as we look to do that, um, may we just uh, start this service um, and try and focus our minds on the reason uh, we're here this morning. Um, despite meeting in a virtual sense, uh, the reason we're m meeting here has not changed at all, uh, and that is to worship a true and living God um, and give thanks for everything that he's done for us. Um, through sending his son to die on a cross for us. Uh, that fact does not change despite our change of venue uh, and means of meeting. So as we open, I'd like to read just a simple verse of scripture uh, that really sums up the reason we're here uh, to look to him this morning. And that comes from the book of John, it's chapter 3 and verse 16. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And that's an amazing fact, one that we're here to worship uh, God for. Uh, and as we do so, I'd like to open this time in prayer um, as we begin our service together this morning. Father God, thank you for this new day. Thank you for everything that you've given us through it already, uh, everything that you've blessed us with. And may we now turn to you uh, and give you thanks and give you praise and glory for everything that you do for us and have done for us in our lives. And most importantly, uh, we give you thanks this morning for sending your son to die on a cross for us so that we, we may have a new and living relationship with you, Father God, a relationship with a God through uh, your son dying on the cross. Thank you that you love us so much that you would do that for us. That is an amazing fact and one that we're here to worship you for this morning. Thank you despite being apart, uh, we can be united together in that fact uh, and spend some time in your presence all the same despite not being together in the church. I pray uh, that you would really bless us as we spend some time in your presence this morning, uh, as we worship you as we open your word, may we learn something more of you this morning, Father God, and then take that into our week ahead. May we be renewed in you, and have a new sense of your presence as we carry on into our week. May we try and walk ever closer uh, to you. So commit this time together uh, to you this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope uh, you have a really encouraging time with us this morning uh, and I'm now going to pass off to another Exeter location for the continuation of our service. Thanks.
Good morning, I hope you're all well. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is James. And if you do know me, my name is still James. And today I'll be leading us in prayer. But first of all, I wanted to start by reading a verse from the Bible about prayer, uh, which I think is really relevant to what's going on uh, in the world at the moment. So I'll start with that. It's from Philippians 4, verses, uh, verse 6. And it says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, I think this is incredibly relevant at the moment. I think one of the current certainties is that we don't know what's going to happen next. But what we can know is that God knows what's going to happen next and that he has a plan. And that we can, through all our uncertainties, take our requests and prayers to God. And uh, that's a, a real privilege that we have there, that we can have that conversation with God uh, like we would to a friend. And uh, that's an incredible thing. So we're going to do that now. We're going to go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you. First of all, for what a privilege it is that we can come to you now and that we can pray to you, that we can bring our requests to you, however big or small. Lord, that you're not a distant God, but you're one who wants to be near to us. You want to talk to us. You want to hear from us. You want to have a relationship from us. And Lord, that's, that's so special. We thank you for that. And Lord, we want to pray for those uh, this time who feel lonely, who uh, who are on their own at the moment, who... Can't see as many people, Lord, I, I pray for those. Lord, that you'll be near to them, that you'll give them a real sense of your your presence, of your peace, Lord, that they'll, they'll know you're near to them. And Lord, I pray for as the country begins to open up a little more, uh, Lord, I pray that you'll uh, be in all that, that you'll be in the decisions that the, the government make, that our leaders make. Lord, that you'll be at the centre of all those decisions. Lord, that uh, things won't happen in the time that the media suggests or that uh, the ways of man want, Lord, that the decisions will be made in your time, Lord. So your timing is perfect. And Lord, I pray for, for those uh, abroad, Lord, in countries that maybe haven't 
got the situation under control so well, oh Lord, that are in the, the peak of their crisis, I pray for them, Lord, that you'll again be near to them, that you'll be uh, a real peace to them, that they'll know your presence as well, Lord. And for our key workers, uh, Lord, our healthcare staff, our teaching staff, uh, our delivery drivers and all those in between, Lord, those that are having to go out and face uh, this virus head on, Lord, we know that you can protect them and we pray that you will protect them, Lord, that your will will be done. And for the word that's going to be preached today, Lord, would you speak to us from it uh, and would you really bless us? Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading is taken from John chapter 15, verses 1 to 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch, and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Hi everyone, uh, really great to be with you this morning. Welcome to this online YouTube service. Thank you so much to everyone who has taken part, to, um, to Jem who, who led for us, to James who prayed for us, to Gina who read for us, and thank you to the, the massive worship group that we had this morning as well. Um, it's a really great thing to be a part of, to see all of your faces and all of the sounds coming out um, of the TV this morning. Uh, I think this week especially was a week where we had a return to the St. Thomas sound of the worship group, having all of those faces there. So thank you for that. It was a great reminder of what it was like to worship together as a community in church. It is my privilege um, to be able to take you through God's word. Um, I'm so thankful to be able to do that. And over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the I am sayings uh, in the Gospel of John. These instances in the gospel where Jesus stands up and he says something crucial about himself that he wants us to understand and grapple with. And this morning we're taking a look at the last of these sayings because Jesus stands up in John 15 and in verse 1 he just comes out with it and he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And in this passage, Jesus essentially elaborates on this metaphor, this idea that he is a vine and that his followers are like branches that are connected to him. 
Now, I personally find it very helpful to see a picture um, whenever I hear of a metaphor. So here is one for you. It's going to pop up on the screen, probably here. And uh, you can look at it. Look at this vine. Um, you look at the top of it and you see this cluster of branches and, and loads of grapes on it. But then you look at the bottom of the picture and you see that there's only one vine that is connected to all of those grapes. And this is what Jesus wants us to be like as his followers. He wants us to be connected to him in the same way a branch is connected to a vine. Now this metaphor is really popular. Um, Christians refer to it all the time and there's loads here that we could discuss. But I think the most pressing questions when we read a passage like this one are why is Jesus using this metaphor and what does this metaphor actually mean? And I think we read in verse 4 the answer to these questions. We read that this metaphor is designed to help us understand what it means to abide in Jesus or remain in Jesus if you have an NIV. Let me read verse 4 for you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So Jesus wants us to abide in him. And I think this morning I want to spend our time thinking and looking at uh, and figuring out what abiding in Jesus looks like. And I want to suggest to you that Jesus encourages us to do two things through his invitation for us to abide in him. The first thing Jesus asks us to do is simply put our trust in him. Put your trust in him. That's going to be the first point. The second thing Jesus asks us to do is to keep obeying him. So put your trust in him and keep obeying him. Let's have a look at this passage uh, to understand what Jesus is saying here. So trusting in Jesus, trust in Jesus, that's the first point. So to understand how we're to trust in him, I think we should first understand who we are trusting in. And Jesus tells us who we're trusting in by saying that he is the true vine. And in using this vine metaphor, uh, Jesus is pointing us back to the Old Testament, the Old Testament of the Bible, because a vine in the Old Testament was a symbol for God's chosen people, Israel. But what's really interesting uh, is that every time Israel is referred to as a vine in the Old Testament, it is always in a negative way. It's always about how Israel are a pretty bad vine. Israel does not bear fruit. An example of this is Ezekiel 15 verse 6, and there are plenty of examples, but let me read this one for you. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, as I have given the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest as fuel for the fire, so will I treat the people living in Jerusalem. So he's saying that Israel is a vine, Jerusalem is a vine, they're about as useful as firewood. But throughout the Old Testament, God promises that there is going to be a day where he renews Israel, where there would be a new Israel that would do things right. And Hosea 11 is an example of this. This new Israel, you can read it in your own time, this new Israel would obey God's commands and would have a proper relationship with God. And everyone is looking forward to this renewal of Israel throughout the Old Testament. So you fast forward a few years and now you have Jesus in John 15 standing before his disciples who are all Jews and he says, I am the true vine. And at this point, the penny starts to drop because this new Israel that everyone has been waiting for, this new Israel is not a nation. This true vine is a person and his name is Jesus. And this makes a massive difference because all of a sudden you realise that even though for thousands of years, Jews thought that their source of life that their ticket to eternal life was their Jewishness. Being identified as a Jew, being under that umbrella, being a part of the nation of Israel, if they, if they sacrificed in the right way, if they kept themselves clean, that is what is going to allow them to have eternal life. That is what is going to allow them to have life in God. But then Jesus arrives on the scene, and he is basically, through saying that he is the vine, through which they should be connected to, he is, he is showing them that actually, 
their Jewishness, their cultural identity is not their source of life. Jesus is their source of life. He is the life that they're looking for. He is the vine that they need to be in. And they won't find life, they won't find eternal life anywhere else. This is a kind of a theme throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus is often replacing these Old Testament way of doing things and he's doing them in so much better of a way. Remember the Good Shepherd sermon a few weeks ago. Jesus is this better, truer shepherd in the same way he is the better, truer vine, Israel. And this has been something Jesus has been teaching us throughout this series. Jesus wants us to know that he and he alone is the source of life. Think back to last week, uh, what did Stephen teach from John 14, 6? He said that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And then the week before that, in John eleven twenty five, 25, we read that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. This is the thing we need to understand. True life. Life that lasts forever, life that is abundant, is only found when you are connected to the source of life. True life, life that lasts forever, life that is abundant, is only found when you are connected to the source of life. And that is Jesus. So when Jesus stands up and he says, abide in me, in verse 4, Firstly, this first way of abiding, Jesus is standing up and he's saying, put your trust in me. Abiding in me is putting your trust in me, believing that I'm the true vine and that my death and my resurrection has made a way for you to have life. Now, I'm sure lots of you will be sitting in front of the TV or the laptop and you'll be thinking, great, I've done that. I'm a Christian. I'm a branch. I have abided. I am in Christ. And I want to show you that this makes a huge difference. That abiding in Jesus gives you a rock hard security. And I say this, it sounds like a jump. Like, where is he going with this? But I say this because on the first reading of this metaphor, it's, it's easy to, to read this metaphor and to think that unless you do well and bear lots of fruit as a Christian, then God is going to cut you off and throw you away. We read verse 2, which says that the vine dresser cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. And then we read in verse 6 that uh, Jesus says, if you do not remain in me, if you do not abide in me, you are like a, a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burnt. And I mean, it might just be me, but I don't think it is. It's easy to read this passage and think, oh no, if, if I'm not particularly fruitful in my life, if I don't do much with with what what I've been given then am I gonna kind of lose my salvation so the question is will God judge us and cast us off if we don't do well well I want to say no unequivocally no absolutely not that is not what this passage is saying after all we read and we've read throughout this series in the gospel of John that this simply isn't the case. In John 6, 37, Jesus says, all those the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. So Jesus says he'll never drive those away who his Father gives to him. And then in John 10, verses 27 to 28, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. Again, more life. And they shall never perish. They shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And I believe there's a pretty sound argument throughout the Gospels, throughout the Bible, that once you are a Christian, you have total security in Christ. Those are just two examples, two pretty clear examples. So the question still remains, what is Jesus talking about when he says that branches here are thrown into the fire? Branches that don't bear fruit are thrown into the fire. Well, um, there's a helpful John Piper article uh, on the, the Desiring God website, which I'd really recommend. It's got loads of resources. Um, but I read this article on John 15, and it helped me with my interpretation of this. Um, I'd recommend the article, and I'll put a link in the description of this video for you to, to have a look at if you want to read it too. But basically, he suggests that the branches that are cut off and burnt are actually people who say that they are followers of Jesus. They say they are Christians but really they're not at all. These are people who say they have, 
believed in Jesus, but they haven't actually believed and accepted Jesus for themselves. They're not true believers. And the reason we can deduce this is because in God's, in John's, sorry, John's, not God's, John's gospel especially, there are loads of instances of people who say that they are disciples. They say that they are branches of the true vine. But then when the rubber hits the road, they are nowhere to be found. Let me read to you John 2 verses 23 to 24. We read this. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, this is Jesus, Many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. You see, there's this group of people, they see all the cool stuff Jesus has done. They say, oh, we believe in him. Yet they don't really believe in who he is. So Jesus doesn't entrust himself to them. Jesus sees the hearts. They don't believe in who Jesus is and what he does. They believe that he's the source of life. They just believe that he's the source of cool miracles. And then if that's not enough, a classic example to, to prove this is, is Judas. I mean, Judas was the, the branchiest of branches. If there was ever a branch, it was going to be Judas. He spent years connected to Jesus. Yet he betrayed him, proving that he was not a true branch. And Jesus basically says himself in John 6, 70, that Judas, though he was one of the 12 chosen disciples, he's basically a devil. He's literally a devil, is what he says. So the branches in this passage that are cast into the fire are basically false followers of Jesus, people that have never fully understood and responded to the gospel. And I think this is crucial for us to understand. Jesus in this passage is, is not telling us that Christians need to wash their backs, watch their backs or else they'll be cut off. He's saying that false believers who actually aren't in Christ at all, though they may think they are, they will be recognised and chopped off the vine by the Father. So if you have understood the gospel, if you are a Christian, you can have a 100% assurance that you will not be chopped off, you will not fall away. Once you are in Christ, you are always in Christ. So that is the, the, the first part to understanding what abiding is. It is simply trusting in Jesus, trusting in Jesus for salvation. And the second part, really, as I've said, is abiding is, is obeying. And in order to obey, you need to have a really good understanding of the fact that abiding is, first and foremost, trusting in Jesus. Now, what do I mean by this? Jesus wants his disciples to understand this, because in verse three, he says this, he says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. And when you read the first few verses of this chapter, that verse in particular seems really misplaced. You could kind of do without it, but Jesus clearly decides to put this, this saying in before he tells them to abide. So before the invitation to abide comes, before the invitation to, to bear much fruit comes, Jesus says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Jesus is reminding his disciples that they are saved, that they are his, that they have heard the words he spoke and they have accepted them. And the reason he's doing this is, is that he's making it very, very clear that you do not abide fruit, you do not obey Jesus, you do not grow in Christ in order to be saved, in order to be made clean. Jesus makes it so clear. He says, you are already clean. You have trusted and abided in me, past tense. And now he is going to invite them in verse four to abide in him, present and future tense. So we abide in the past by trusting in Jesus' salvation, but we also abide in the present and in the future. And we need to get it that way around. You see, unless you are totally secure, unless you understand that your status as a child of God is totally secure, that you have abided in Jesus, unless you understand that, then you will try and grow in Jesus, you'll try and abide in the present and the future tense, and you're going to do it out of fear. You're going to do it out of fear that you could be thrown into the fire or judged by God. And when you live the Christian life that way, then you'll become reliant on your own abilities to save yourself, 
instead of being reliant on God and his salvation in Jesus. And, and this is the opposite of what Jesus wants. This is the opposite of what Jesus wants. And that's why Jesus, before he tells us anything about how to bear fruit and what bearing fruit is, he first, in verse 3, reminds us and his disciples that they are already clean. They are secure in him. You see, Jesus didn't want people joining a soup kitchen or practicing patience or helping someone with their shopping in order to try and earn salvation. He wants people to do these things out of love for him. And Jesus, for the rest of this passage, elaborates on and encourages us to abide in him continually in that continuous sense. And it's something we need to, to make a conscious decision to do every day. Let me give you an example because it's important to understand um, the difference between abiding something you've done and something you're doing. Now, growing up, um, I was what you would call a couch potato. Um, that is a term that was assigned to me by, by many, which I think was a fair term. Don't worry, it wasn't a nasty term by any means. But if there was ever a, a, a chance to go outside and play in the sun, uh, a choice to do that or a choice to, to stay inside and watch TV and play games, I would always do the latter. I'd want to just sit on the sofa and, and watch the Disney Channel or the Nickelodeon Channel or something like that. I don't know why. Um, I just wasn't particularly outgoing. And this was fine most of the year, you know, I think I had an understanding with, with my parents and with my brothers, you know, um, don't ask me to go outside, no one ask you to do anything bad. But when it came to going on holiday as a family, this is when, you know, things would get a bit trickier. Because we get to the place we're staying in, um, wherever it was, you know, like a, a nice house or whatever, and all I wanted to do was stay inside. And my dad would say, um, you know, there are these cool historical sites all over the place around the corner. We could go and visit. And I'd just be on the sofa and I'd be like, no, nah, I don't want to. I just want to stay inside and do nothing. Now, to a degree, I've, I've changed a lot since then. Don't worry. I, like the outdoors is much better. I still burn horribly in the sun. But picture this. I'm 12 years old and I'm sitting in a house in sunny Spain. There is a swimming pool outside. There are amazing cultural artifacts a couple of miles away. But I am content sitting inside a house when the sun is just blisteringly sunny outside and there's so much outside to enjoy. Now I'm sitting in that house and I'm, I'm safe and sound. Nothing's going to change that. But if only I just got up and went outside, I'd realise that there is so much more to holidaying in Spain. There is so much more to enjoy if I just get up and go outside. And I think that is what is meant by abiding in Jesus. You see, in Christ, we are, we are safe and sound. We are a branch that is attached to the vine. But instead of just sitting there in comfort, God calls us to, to listen to his voice. He calls us to obey him. You see, if you're a true believer, your heart has been changed. The Holy Spirit is making himself at home in your heart. and He's prompting you to go outside, to become more like Jesus. In the last chapter uh, before this one, in John 14, verse 26, Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit. He says, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit exists to teach us and to remind us of Jesus' words. So when Jesus calls us to abide in him, really, it's quite simple. All we need to do is listen to that prompting of the Holy Spirit. We need to, to hear his voice and to obey it. So why do we need to obey it? Well, Jesus tells us in verses 10 and 11, of John 15, the chapter that is before us now. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandment, commandments and abide in his love, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. You see, Jesus is saying that when we as Christians, when we obey God, we have his love. We abide in it, we enjoy it, and we have the fullest of joys as a result. It is that simple. You know, when I was couch potatoing in Spain on holiday, my parents would always stand by the door and they'd ask me to go outside. 
they'd say, Tom, just get up and go and swim in the pool or go and do other things that you enjoy, go and play with your brothers outside. They knew that would be a better use of my time. And once I kind of sluggishly got up off the sofa and I listened to them, I went outside and I did end up enjoying myself. Parents generally do know better than their kids. It's a funny thing that almost, yeah, wonder if that's the best kept secret or something. Now, I don't want to give my parents a, a God complex, but my parents on holiday in Spain, they were actually performing the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives as Christians. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one who calls us to obey. The Holy Spirit is the one who calls us to, to get up and go and enjoy the life of a Christian, to go and abide in Jesus' love, to go and obey and do good things. And when we do that, when we listen, when we, like me as a kid in Spain, when we go outside and we begin to grow in our love for Jesus, we experience joy. That's why Jesus mentions that our joy will be full in verse 11. And you see, Jesus, he cares for our joy. He's telling us the secret of joy. People spend their whole lives looking for, for fun things to do, but Jesus is telling us right here in this passage what will bring us joy. And it's obedience. It's obeying God. It's loving him, knowing that he wants us to experience the fullness of his love and obeying him, looking at the Bible, seeing what he wants us to live like and joyfully submitting to his will. And it is in this joyful place, hearing and obeying God's voice, that we bear fruit. Because hearing and obeying God's voice, that is what will provide us with the right conditions needed for you as a branch to bear fruit. It will give us the sunshine and the rain that is needed. Because abiding in Jesus, we're meant to abide and we're meant to bear fruit for him. Now, I think the natural follow-on follow on from this is, is what does this fruit look like? We know we're meant to abide in Jesus and bear fruit, and we've discussed that abiding is trusting in him for salvation, and that abiding is obeying him and continuing to grow in him and going outside and enjoying uh, the Christian life. And when we do that, we bear fruit, Jesus says. Now, he doesn't actually mention what this fruit is in the metaphor, which is interesting, um, but in Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23, Paul uses a similar metaphor to tell us practically what we will look like as Christians when we bear fruit. We're told that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And this is the beautiful thing. Jesus perfectly embodies all of those character traits. So when you abide in Jesus, you begin to develop those qualities. In the same way when you hang out with friends for a prolonged period of time, you start to pick up their mannerisms and their traits. When you abide in Jesus, you develop the qualities, the, these fruits of the Spirit, those wonderful qualities, the, the love and the joy and the patience and the peace and the kindness and the goodness and the faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And people will look at you and, and they'll see that you're a vine with lots of fruit. And people will say, wow, that's a, that's a healthy looking vine. You must have an impressive vine dresser. And you will be giving God glory because people will look at you and they'll be amazed at him. They'll think, how is this person all of these things? It's because you are connected to the true vine. You're connected to the author of love, the author of joy, the author of peace. And that is the aim of it all, to bring God glory, ultimately. That's why in verse 8, Jesus says, by this, everything he said, by this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And the beautiful thing about this, this whole process, is that we don't just will ourselves to salvation. And we also don't just will ourselves to bearing fruit. We don't just squeeze our knuckles tight and just try and bear fruit as Christians. God practically helps us in this process. God helps us to bear fruit. And in verse two, he tells us that the father prunes us 
the Father prunes us in order that we will bear more fruit. Let me show you a, a picture of what a pruned grapevine looks like. It will pop up here. And I mean, you look at that picture, I don't know about you, but it looks like an absolute mess. You look at it and it looks like this vine has been cut back savagely. Um, how on earth could this vine bear fruit? But actually what has happened in this picture is that an expert vine dresser has cut the vine in precisely the right places, all to encourage growth. And I think what this means for us when we look at our lives, if you're a Christian and you might look at your life and you might see a mess. You might think, oh, I didn't get the job I wanted. You might be frustrated because your exams this year are looking frustratingly different. Maybe you're stuck at home and you're just wishing you could see loved ones. Whatever hard situation you're going through, whatever mess you are living through right now. You might be thinking, how on earth could God do this to me? How on earth could God do this or that to me? Well, this passage shows us that if you're a Christian, then the, the master vine dresser, God himself, is preparing you to bear more fruit for him. God ultimately works all things together for the good of those who love him. And that is what God can do with any situation that looks like a mess to us. We just have to trust that God is pruning us. God is cutting us away in the right places to help us to grow more fruit, to grow in those godly characteristics, to abide in him further and deeper. Now, some of you might be thinking and sitting there, um, Christian or not, and thinking, well, that's just plain unfair. How does God get the right to prune us as humans? What on earth uh, does that mean? How on earth can I worship a God that does that? A God that deliberately cuts us in certain places to encourage grace. And I think in those circumstances, um, the words of Tim Keller, who's a pastor in New York, not a pastor anymore, but he was a pastor for many years. The words of Tim Keller really ring true because into this circumstance, he says, this. He says, Jesus was cut off the vine so that we could just be cut back. Jesus was cut off the vine so that we could just be cut back. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus was completely cut off from the Father. He was cut off from the source of life itself so that we wouldn't have to be, so that we could have the opportunity to be connected to the true vine to be connected to him so that instead of us being cut off we could just be pruned that we could grow you know in the same way uh, a father or a mother disciplines a child god is in that business too with us he knows what is best for us and he will use situations that we see as completely horrible uh, to grow us and i think we can take real comfort that in the hard times Jesus knows exactly what we're going through because Jesus was cut off completely from the branch. He wasn't just pruned, he was cut off. Let me finish our time together by telling you something. You know, every Christian, by definition, bears some degree of fruit for God. As we've read um, earlier, those who don't bear any fruit at all aren't actual believers, they're false believers. But there are Christians who bear very little fruit there are Christians who aren't really enjoying what it is to know God. They're unproductive for the kingdom. They aren't bringing God much glory at all. And ultimately, that is, that is a sin because it's going against God's purpose for us as Christians to bear much fruit. That's what Jesus says. He says he wants us to bear much fruit, this to prove that you are my disciples. And I think the problem is that there are Christians who earnestly try to bear fruit, earnestly try to, to do good things, to, to have godly characteristics, the ones I've all mentioned, but they go about it in the complete wrong way. They try to do good Christian stuff, but the fruit doesn't have any value because the motivation is all wrong. Instead of bearing fruit as a natural process of loving and abiding in Jesus, they try to bear fruit from a place of fear and a place of pride. Fear because they're, they're worried that God will punish them if they don't do well, so they need to try really hard to do good things or pride because they actually think they can bear fruit and live the Christian life on their own. They don't see their need for God. They don't come to God in prayer and they say, help me. In both of those situations, living in fear and living in pride, you are not giving glory to God. 
And so many Christians live this way. Myself included, at times I find myself living in either two of these camps, forgetting my need for Jesus, or just living out of fear. But Jesus in this passage in John 15 speaks of just such a better motivation for the Christian life. Jesus tells us that we are, as branches connected to the true vine, we are, we are totally secure in him. Nothing will change that. We have been made clean because of the words he has spoken into us. And from that place of security, we can grow. We can look to Jesus. We can hear his voice and we can obey him because we love him. And if we aren't doing this, the remedy is simple. It's so simple. All we need to do is, is simply come back to God, repent that we haven't been abiding in him, and ask him to help you abide in his love, to experience his joy, and to bear fruit as a result. Are you abiding in Jesus? Are you bearing fruit? If you aren't, just come to him. Abide in him. Seek him. Enjoy him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that Jesus in the Gospel of John decided to stand up on seven occasions and give us these amazing I am sayings. And Father, I thank you that he said that I am the true vine, that no longer did the Jewish nation have to cling to their cultural identity for their source of life, but that Jesus alone is the source of life. And that when we are connected to him, we are encouraged to continue to grow in him, to grow in obedience, to grow in love, to grow in joy, just by being connected to the source of all of those things. Father, for those listening this morning who, who are not abiding in Jesus, whether they aren't abiding in you because they're not Christians or whether they are Christians and they're just not abiding in you right now, Father, I pray that you'll just humble us, help us to realise we cannot do this by ourselves, we cannot live life by ourselves. Left to our own devices, we will live a life of fear or a life of pride. Father, we ask that you'll help us in our walk of obedience. Help us to, to leave the indoors, to go outside and to grow in our love for you. Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus.
Uh, hello again, so we've come to the end of our service. Uh, thank you for joining us in this way. Uh, we really hope you've been encouraged by uh, what you've heard and what you've read um, uh, and what has been said uh, over this time. Really hope that you can come back uh, and in enjoy spending time uh, in God's presence with us in this way uh, in the future. Uh, there will be another service uploaded this evening uh, in, in lieu of our evening service this evening. Um, thank you to all those who have taken part uh, in the various capacities. Uh, really great stuff uh, that we can all take part in this way. Uh, and so I would just simply like to close in prayer now uh, as we close this time together uh, and move off in, in, into the rest of our days. Father, uh, simply thank you for this time that we've had together. Um, for everything that has been said, uh, we give you thanks and uh, pray that uh, we will have really learnt more of you this morning um, through looking deeper into your word uh, and really looking to you um, and looking at what you have to say uh, to us through it uh, and through the, the contributions made by, made by others this morning here as well. I pray that we'd be encouraged in, in such a way that we would really take it into our week ahead uh, and really try and live lives uh, that please you um, and that glorify you. May we try and do everything that we do to your glory uh, as we seek to grow in our relationship with you. Um, Father God, I pray that that would be the case. So I commit us all uh, to your care for, for the next days and weeks ahead um, and pray your hand over all of us this morning. Give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so thanks once again uh, and hope you have a great rest of the day.